Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Headed Home quarterly series sponsored by the Military Committee um, of the Delaware Suicide Prevention Coalition. We're really excited to be able to offer this hybrid option of in-person at the Wilmington Friends Quaker Meeting House and also virtually on Zoom. And so we want to thank our friends um, at the Meeting House for offering this space, this beautiful space to us to be able to have this panel session tonight. Um, tonight's panel session is on spiritual care for moral injury. And we are recording the session to post on our Mental Health Association website later on for viewing. Um, and also we have um, the microphones muted. And so if you can keep your microphones muted for those of you who are on Zoom, that would be great. You can also change your screen preferences around if you are on Zoom to better suit your needs. Um, and if you do have any questions, if you can type them into the Q&A or chat box, that would be most appreciated. My name is Jennifer So, and I am the Deputy Director at the Mental Health Association in Delaware. And I have the privilege of moderating tonight's panel session. And we have joining us Jessica Lewis, Tom Davis, and Father Donald Van Alstein. And so we'll start with some introductions. Jessica, if you wouldn't mind going first. <laughs> so hello, glad to be here. Um, I'm Jessica Lewis, and I run a little company called Sculpt Your Life, and uh, under that umbrella, I teach fitness and nutrition, and probably more importantly than anything else, uh, relaxation techniques, primarily Tai Chi. And uh, a number of years ago, I became involved with a federal program called Tai Chi for Veterans, and it's a really phenomenal program. Um, gosh, through that program, I've met all these amazing people, including this gentleman right here and all of you people in the room. So, uh, boy, it's amazing what things happen when you think you're on the way to someplace else. Um, that's all I want to say about me. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jessica. And Jessica actually joined our Military and Veterans Committee of the Delaware Suicide Prevention Coalition during the pandemic. And so this is actually our first time seeing her, well, for some of us in this room. And so it really is exciting to do this and to be in person again. And so thank you so much for being a part of tonight's panel session. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, I would. Uh, I'm Tom Davis. I'm a retired Presbyterian pastor. I sometimes call myself a Quaker Tyrian <laughs> because I'm a Vietnam veteran and the Quakers were helpful in bringing me home sane. Okay? And it was in this very place in 2015 that I was reading a Quaker magazine about a veteran suicide and discovered to my utter horror that 22 veterans each day were taking their own lives. That figure is still pretty much the same today. Uh, so a lot of my passion for this comes from my personal experience uh, and my spiritual experience walking with Quakers and, and Presbyterians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. And Tom has been involved with our committee for a very long time. And so we're really appreciative of just the knowledge and the experience that he brings to the table and to our meetings, and also for participating in tonight's panel session. So thank you so much, Tom. And Father Van. Good evening, uh, Father Don Van Alstein. Um, I have 20 years of service in the Army, um, two years of which was when I was drafted, about your time period, 1966 to 68. And after I uh, got discharged in 1972, I had a 27 year break in service, and then came back as a army chaplain, Catholic chaplain. And that's where I have found uh, the fullness of what it means to be a minister, to be a priest uh, in a pluralistic uh, environment, the military, uh, to either perform or provide. And that has been a wonderful learning experience on my part. So in coming back to the Army as a chaplain, uh, I have had two deployments, one with the 10th Mountain Division in 2003, 2004. And then I had a second, that was in Kandahar, Afghanistan. My second deployment was to be a brigade chaplain, third brigade chaplain, first Army Division. Uh, and back to Afghanistan, this time in Wardak Logar province. After that experience, I uh, came back and was a pastor at a uh, military community at Fort Eustis, Virginia. 
and retired uh, in 2014. And my transition from active duty military as a chaplain is to go into the VA Medical Center and to be a, a chaplain for our veterans. What a beautiful transition, as far as I'm concerned, where uh, I think I have a, a instant kind of credibility of understanding what veterans have gone through in the military experience. And so it's just an honor to be able to be a part of this group to respect that moral injury and what our veterans go through particularly facing combat. Thank you so much, Father Van. This is my first time meeting you, but I've heard great things about you. You came highly recommended, so we're really appreciative that you can join us tonight. And we're really excited for this discussion that we're going to have on moral injury. And so just to kind of start off, what exactly is moral injury? Because I think some of us don't know exactly what that term means. Well, the group has asked me to uh, speak on that. Moral injury is a term that uh, came to be used because of research done by a fellow named Che uh, with Vietnam veterans. And he noticed that they were suffering not only from what was prior called shell shock, today it's called post-traumatic stress, but also from an affliction of the conscience. So he started using the term moral injury to refer to a deep wound to the conscience because of something one did or failed to do in the line of duty while one was doing one's military duty, uh, which resulted in a, a, a lingering sense of shame and and would contribute to depression. Uh, now, more recently, moral injury has been more broadly applied. These days it's being used to talk about what doctors and nurses are experiencing because of COVID pressures. Uh, I've even uh, seen it applied to uh, some uh, small family farm farmers losing their farms and feeling shame about that. Uh, but it started out as a military uh, associated term. Let me give you a couple examples of what might cause uh, moral injury. Let's say, and these are taken from uh, real world examples. Uh, let's say a couple of uh, GIs are posted at a security station and uh, approaching them is a vehicle. And it's supposed to stop at their position and they're supposed to uh, search the car and uh, make sure that the people are not armed and so on. But on this day, it keeps coming, it keeps coming. And uh, they may gesture, they may shoot into the air to let the folks in the car know that they must stop, but the car does not stop. And they feeling they must protect uh, their buddies behind them, uh, they fire at the car and the car crashes. They then open the door and they discover they've killed a family. They've killed husband, wife, and child. Uh, they didn't want to do that. It was unintentional, but they feel somehow responsible because it was their act that involved in the loss of death, mm -hmm. in loss of life. That's one example. Mm -hmm. A second example might be, that's a, by the way, that's an example of commission. An example of omission might be, uh, if you're in a firefight and the guy next to you, the buddy next to you gets killed and you don't, and you feel responsible for failing to do something that might have kept him alive. And uh, that can contribute <coughs> to a deep uh, shame and regret. Uh, the third example is rare, but nevertheless true. And that is the experience of seeing in an enemy that you have harmed, that you've perhaps killed or maimed, seeing the humanity in that person ex post facto after the deed is done. Uh, let's say you kill an enemy soldier and you rifle through his belongings and you discover there a letter and a photograph. And though it's in a different language, you perceive right away that that letter might be like the one that you're carrying in your own uniform. That photograph of a, of a woman might be his wife or sister and you have one in your own wallet. Uh, I say that's rare because in war you're taught that you must not let personal feelings interfere with your moral duty to kill. Your moral duty, I say. That's why <laughs> this is all very confusing, you see. Someone suffering from moral injury not only feels pain and regret, but also confusion because they 
felt they were doing what duty required and yet they feel bad for it afterwards. Right. So that's moral injury. Thank you for defining that. Well, I'd like to compliment about what you just said. Another aspect of it is what you all described, what you just described, and that is the realization that I didn't realize I had the capacity to kill someone. I have never had that position before. I'm, I'm a loving family member. I love my wife. I love my children. Uh, I think I'm a good person. I've done good things. And now I'm saying for the first time that I have the capacity to kill another person. And that does severe damage to, to, the, to the soul mm -hmm. of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems like there's this complex feeling of, you know, having done the right thing, but also feeling guilt, extreme guilt, and kind of analyzing, did I actually do the right thing when this was my line of duty, when this was my mission, when this is what I was supposed to do for my country or whatever it was supposed to be, but also looking at yourself in a different light because now it seems like you're capable of doing something that you weren't originally thought that you were capable of doing. Right. So that's bad. Right, so it's kind of this complex tug and war. And I, I might also add that uh, maybe it's been since Vietnam, when warfare has been conducted more in small units, that the individual soldier is sometimes on his own in acting. He has a mission to carry out, but, but he in the moment must decide how to affect that mission in the most efficient way. And sometimes the decisions one makes in the spur of the moment to keep oneself alive one regrets afterwards because they don't turn out like we might have wished. See, and it, you feel more responsible because indeed no one gave you that order. You reacted. You had a mission order, but you didn't have a tactic order. So the small, the small units make a big difference. Now today's panel session is on spiritual care for moral injury. And so if you could define spirituality for us and then also explain maybe some of the nuanced differences between spiritual care resources versus religious care resources and how those differ or how those compare, that would be great. Well, uh, uh, Father Van and I, uh, being leaders of congregations, uh, will confess, will, will uh, attest to the fact that our society and many others are becoming more secular. And many people these days are saying, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And we trying to sustain the strength of a congregation uh, would wish that more people uh, were uh, practicing active religious, but alas, that's not happening. On the other hand, we may feel as uh, people that are reflective that there is something to be said for this statement. I'm spiritual. And so the three of us have talked about that. We've had about three or four sessions before this one mm -hmm. to decide what is spiritual? What does it mean? It's, it's not a well-defined word, uh, but we have some ideas. I would also say that there's a confusion that people oftentimes make in terms of be, you know, being religious and being part of a religious affiliation mm -hmm. as opposed to just being spiritual mm -hmm. what you're saying. And so uh, oftentimes I say, uh, I'm, I don't belong to any religion because a religion is all about a system of beliefs, certain values uh, that requires you to be a part of that community and to worship and ritualize in a certain kind of way. Uh, and that's often done not today, it's not very popular. But I would also say in terms of spirituality, I think every human being is created to be human is to be spiritual mm -hmm. and, and the capacity one to do something that the animal world can't do that's transcendence mm -hmm. finding meaning and purpose mm -hmm. that, that just drives you with the energy to to come alive mm -hmm. and so everyone has that kind of human capacity to be spiritual i'd love to jump in here actually mm -hmm. because i've observed that human beings uh, have this love of uh, ritual. And so even, so the secular world would often come to me, you know, to practice spirituality. Uh, but what they don't realize is 
one of the reasons why they like what I do is because they love ritual. <laughs> and you know, the Chinese have this ancient saying that we get really good at what we practice most, right? So that's why they come to a Tai Chi class that so they can practice a ritual. And through that ritual, they achieve some sense of transcendence. Right. And then what often happens is their relationship with God becomes strengthened. So in some ways, there's really no difference between spirituality and certain religious practice. I mean, it all kind of overlaps like a big Venn diagram. Well, I differ a little bit in thinking that spirit is confined only to humans. Hmm. Oh, um, okay. I, uh, I think of spirit as life energy. Hmm. I think of it as the... Uh, propensity to endure, to, I, it's associated with grit, <laughs> to stick with something that's tough, to endure. Um, and animals often you know, display that. Uh, I associate it also with creativity. And believe it or not, some animals exhibit creative behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen painting elephants, yes. I have not. You gotta know, watch more YouTube. <laughs> yes, <I do. laughs> they actually paint pictures of other elephants. Yes, oh and God. it's not it's not programmed. They do it uh, evidently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I associate it with um, the will to connect to others, the, mm -hmm. a, a, a strong sociality. You see this in, in animals as well as human beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see it especially with dogs because they're domesticated to be mm -hmm. our friends. But uh, yeah, it's not it's it's not a, a, a monopoly uh, for, for uh, to be a human being includes a spirit, but so does so, so does animals also also have spirit. Mm -hmm. Now that you say that, um, I do agree with you one hundred percent because I have seen videos, for example, of elephants that are mourning the death of yeah. another element, yeah. how they gather together. Uh, my Lord, uh, if that is spiritual, I don't know what it is. And that's that tendency to, to want to connect, to connect. stay connected. Yeah. And agree. Yeah. And so the, the capacity for empathy yes. uh, and, and compassion is not strictly human. It's, mm -hmm. it's built into Absolutely. human, human or it's built into creatures. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're beginning to touch upon you know, things that are sort of built into the cosmos too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most injurious aspects of moral injury, I imagine, is uh, the misperception that I am me and you are you and you are dangerous. So yeah. I'm going to protect me. Yeah, and training brings that up. Yeah. I mean, military training accentuates that's all about. Yeah. But after you've done this thing, you notice you look like me. Mm. Oh my word, you're more like me than I realized. Yes. Perhaps we are the same. That's right. And through practices like Tai Chi, they enable us to get in touch with aspects of our human experience that we often cover up with all this crazy activity. So we sort of forget that there are, you know, spots inside of us that feel connected all the time to everybody. Uh, tai Chi is a good segue uh, because uh, uh, I studied philosophy early on was very fond of the Greeks and the Greeks tended to head philosophy in the direction of dualism, mm -hmm. spirit versus body. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually the two belong very much together. And what I've discovered in working to help veterans get, come home and be safe and whole and happy is that body is as much involved in it as counseling the brain, mm -hmm. very much so. So that's, that's your cue to, <laughs> to talk about uh, a movement meditation. And then later I could talk about seated meditation. But before you do that, <laughs> I, I, I have learned a phrase a long time ago that I continually remind myself of, and that is this, as brilliant as the mind is, it can be seen. We can deceive ourselves with our brilliance. As loving as the heart is, as the country western song goes, you're cheating heart, so we can also cheat. But body 
always speaks the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a very powerful statement. Yeah. That can be because the body is designed to be integrated. Mm -hmm. And, and every, you don't think about your heart. You don't think about it. It just does everything in sync with everything, everything else. And there's your sync. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a book that was written many years ago. And the, the title, I always thought, was so profound. The body keeps the score. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all on that cook. And actually, I got into this work from through two, two watershed moments in my life. Um, the first was uh, caregiving for my first husband who eventually died of the complications related to PTS and Agent Orange poisoning. Um, and he was so committed to strictly Western medicine. And I kept thinking there must be something else that could be helpful here that, and I, I just watched his health just spiral down, 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 down. But I'm, no, no, I'm just going to do what the doctors say. I'm just going to take these pills and down, down, down. So that, that was the first thing that sort of got my motors running, thinking about other things. But the second watershed moment was like a complete and utter shock with absolutely no warning. My very, very healthy, ostensibly happy, incredibly successful 72-year-old father chose to drown himself with no warning whatsoever. So there's an example of the body kept the score on something all those years yep. and nobody knew. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it came back to just overtake him at some point. And how I would say that body speaks that way is when something's not right, the body will say, I'm not right. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a whisper, you keep on ignoring it, keep, and then it speaks louder, right. and you continue to ignore it. I give up. Right. And I used to be a marriage and family therapist, and I'm listening to a client. Uh, sometimes I would listen to my own body to try to figure out what's going on in that client's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Words are being spoken, but I'm not getting the full picture with the words, but my body is telling me some, by mm -hmm. some strange intuition, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know what I love about Tai Chi is, it's funny that my dad drowned, he drowned himself, I should say, because I often think of uh, water metaphors when I teach Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, there's no distinction between the drop of water right out there on the very crest of the wave and the little drop way down at the bottom of the ocean. You know? And the reason why we know that is because if you spill oil in the ocean, it doesn't just stay where it's spilled, right? <laughs> so again, in the human experience, you know, all the action is typically up here. This is where all the surf is, you know, this is where people tend to hang out, right up here. But there are little sparks of something deeper inside the body. And when you're doing these slow meditative movements, which are actually just sort of mimicking the way everything works best when it's working well in the universe, just moving soft, slowly, continuously, kind of like orbits, you, know? <laughs> you, you sort of drop down into this space where you start to realize that the body is probably your greatest limitation. And then you start to see the connections between you and everybody else and you and everything else. You know, it's just, it's very difficult to describe how that feels when you're in the flow. So uh, when I began to research what was working for other veterans mm -hmm. who had both post-traumatic stress and moral injury, they often run together. Mm -hmm. uh, I discovered that um, meditation called power breath, mm -hmm. which is taught free to veterans by the art of living, mm -hmm. was working for a number of veterans. So I decided to get that training mm -hmm. and I've been practicing for four years, my wife now for three. Mm -hmm. And it's very good for our physical health, but it also helps us to be calm. Mm -hmm. And it affects the emotions. I'm not exactly sure how I have a theory. Mm -hmm. We'll go into it. But um, uh, Jennifer and I, uh, Jessica and I, uh, 
uh, talk about, I guess, uh, opposite sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. She works with movement meditation. Mm -hmm. I work with seated meditation, mm -hmm. and they both work. Mm -hmm. so. But they're they're similar though, because yeah. I think actually the way I've heard uh, Leslie explain how power breath works, I think is exactly the same way that the Tai Chi works, because. You know, think about what the body does, how it reacts when you're stressed out. You know, it gets very rigid, you know, and, and you make quick gestures and you startle, you know. And how does the body act when it's relaxed? It moves very slowly, more deliberately, very softly. The voice drops down, the breathing deepens. So I think the reason why Tai Chi makes people better, but I mean, good Lord, Harvard Medical School wrote a book like this thick on why, you know. But I think the reason why it makes people better is because when you when you consciously decide to move in those ways, you trick your body into being relaxed, whether it wants to or not. It just relaxes. And the consequences of it, uh, one of the primary consequences, it seems to me, mm -hmm. is that your whole thought process is more integrated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Much more integrated. Exactly. The clarity of thought like, like a bell. Exactly. Uh, Could you show us uh, some Tai Chi movies? Oh, yeah. 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 So there's you know, the style that I really prefer has only about 20 moves. That's one reason why I like it because it's really easy to learn. Um, I'll just show you. I don't know. I'll show you my favorite one. So if you want to do it with me. Okay. <laughs> Toss and take your glasses. Yeah. I need a little invitation. Bobby, you're welcome too. If you want, you know, yeah. So we usually just start from stillness and then we flow back to stillness. It's sort of like a little standing silent meditation in between the movements. So let's just hang out here for a moment. Just kind of begin to feel the feet touching the floor. Probably the easiest way to do that is just let your knees be kind of soft. Let your tailbone kind of tuck under so you really feel the weight begin to spread out all the way out to the outer margins of the feet. And then let's rest the palms energetically. Yeah, we're just gonna, exactly. If you were sitting down, you'd have your palms on your thighs. So just imagine you're resting your palms on something firm. And I think the best way to describe how to move in Tai Chi is to say, it's sort of like slow-mo walking and then kind of changing your mind. <laughs> so let's do, let's do it that way. So we're just gonna sink down a little bit and then pour every ounce of your weight into your right leg. And once you do that, you can just extend the left knee. Yeah. And then let's do base drum. I'm going to do base drum. Okay. We're going to put the hands up sort of about chest height, about shoulder width apart. Because if you were in a high school marching band, that's about the size of the drum. And that's where it would be. And now we're going to let all the weight that's in your full leg pour into the empty leg, and the fingertips are just gonna circle around the drum. So here we go. Mm. Yeah, let's go even slower. So you know when you're walking, you put all your weight in one foot before you put the other foot out, and then you move forward. But here what we're doing is we're moving forward and then we're changing our minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could get into the nuances, but it's probably not important. I always say the best way to do this particular style of Tai Chi is with the effort of no effort. So even wondering if you're doing it right is probably too much work. Let's do one more. And then to end it, all you have to do is just sort of stand up on the leg that's full. I guess we better do the other side so we don't walk out of here like, what hump, right? <laughs> all right, so let's sink down and shift over to the other way. Yeah, and let's go. Over the years, I think I've gotten slower. 
as I age, because I like to really experience every little nuance. It's better for the balance as well. It might be. You know, on a copier machine, have you ever made a copy with the lid up? You know, the light bar kind of across, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So just feel your weight moving all the way back. Oh, or here's another water metaphor for you. You know how when a wave washes up on the beach, you don't really know when it changes directions, but you know that it does. And one of the things that you helped me with when I was starting off yeah. was that you don't lean your trunk forward. Yeah, just you, let it you float. Lean, you, lean, you, you try to stay erect yeah. as you move forward with your back. Let's do one more. And let's just feel the feet touch on the ground. Nice. Yeah. So the reason why we let the sort of the upper body just sort of float forward and back is because there's this energetic heart in the body. Almost every ancient culture acknowledges that that's so. Um, I like to think of it as sort of about halfway between the belly button and the groin and sort of halfway between your front and your back. And it's way smarter than your brain. And it's way more courageous than your heart. And I kind of like to think of it as the God spark. You know, you know how we have strong gut feelings and we talk ourselves out of it. Yep. Right. So a lot of times when people do a lot of Tai Chi, they end up being more like uh, led around by their Dantian, you know, than they used to. I'm wondering if this um, common response that I have maybe a lot of other people have too, uh, is very fitting to what you just said, mm -hmm. is if you ever catch yourself saying, I knew that was going to happen. Yes. <laughs> and you didn't do anything about it, and yet it happened. Anyway. Yeah. That the whole way that, yeah, I didn't actually say it at the beginning because I got a little camera shy there when we were introducing ourselves, but the whole reason why the Tai Chi for Veterans program was formed by the Department of Veterans Affairs, actually, uh, an arm of the VA called the VA Community Care Network, was because of the suicide rate and because traditional medical interventions were not working. And they wanted to give people something that could relieve their mental and physical mm -hmm. pain. And they looked at that Harvard study, which is, I'm not kidding, it's like six inches thick. And they're like, we cannot ignore this scientific yeah. evidence. It's too profound. And so that's why we do what we do is we're helping people deal with serious mental health diagnoses. I want to uh, speak a little bit about uh, post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. and what, what that is, what the, how that condition comes to be. Uh, when you're in a theater of war, um, a lot of it's boredom. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time is boredom. But when, when, there is, when, when you're in the heat of it, uh, you better depend on your training because you don't really have time to think mm -hmm. much. And uh, so when you're in that automatic pilot condition, you are really, really tense, but you don't feel it until afterwards when your adrenaline stops pumping and you're exhausted. <laughs> That's adrenaline's purpose. Yes, exactly, exactly. Keep you juice. Exactly, exactly. If you're in a theater of war for a rather long time, that uh, condition of being ready to fight or flee endures. You can't turn it off because it's in the body, it's not in the mind. So no matter of deliberation in your mind can make your body relax if you've been in that condition for a long time. So you can't talk yourself out. Can't talk yourself, and nor can a, nor can a counselor. Uh, so that's where these disciplines of the body come in, you see? So I, I asked my uh, seated meditation uh, trainer, how is it that uh, with no uh, guided imagery, with no appeal to the emotions, a mere discipline of breathing in a certain rhythm and for you know, a certain uh, length of time, how does it affect the emotions in a very positive way? And indeed it, it does. How does it work? He said, well, to be honest, we're not exactly sure, but maybe it's something like this. 
He said, when you are in a crisis situation, how are you breathing? <laughs> breathing shallow and fast, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how do your how, how does your body feel? How do you, how do your fists and arms fully feel like I'm on fire? You know, because your your whole circulatory system is tuned up to fight or flee. Yes. Uh, and what about your heart rate? What that, what's that do? Oh, very rapid. Yes, indeed, because you, you might have to fight or flee. That takes extra extra pumping. Okay, so now he says when you spend uh, 45 minutes at a breathing discipline. What happens to your, to your uh, breathing? Well, it becomes slow and easy, relaxed. I don't even think about it. Yes, indeed, that's true. And uh, how, do, how does your body feel? It feels absolutely relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the body and the mind are so intricately interrelated that when one responds to a condition, the other does too. So when you, by breathing discipline or by Tai Chi discipline, bring your body into a certain state, which is usually associated emotionally with calmness, lo and behold, you become calm. It's really remarkable. And it's something that I've discovered very late in my life. You know, I studied philosophy and psychology early on. That's all in the head. But uh, uh, due to my work with, uh, with veterans, uh, I've discovered the importance of the body. Yeah, it's very important. Thank you so much for just kind of this discussion and the demonstration that you just showed. Um, Tom, I know when you were having um, the discussion with Father Van and with Jessica kind of planning for the session, you had referenced the deepest well, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. in the book. And I think they referenced six things that everyone needs to be healthy, including adequate nutrition, adequate sleep, adequate exercise, meditation, mm -hmm. professional mental health, if you need it, and connection with others. Um, Tom, could you explain a little bit more about these kind of needs and how we can better meet those who are experiencing moral injury where they're at? Yeah. Uh, well, by the way, I discovered those in a book called The Deepest Well, written by a Jamaican-American pediatrician who has studied ACEs. ...in the high suicide rate amongst children and, uh, uh, and mental illness at later in life. Uh, but she says the way to recover from, to be resilient uh, after post-traumatic stress is to practice the six things that make a healthy human being. <laughs> and you just went through them. Uh, adequate nutrition, uh, adequate exercise, uh, uh, sleep, adequate sleep, um, meditation, see a counselor if and when you need it, okay? and association with a supportive community. Uh, very, very important. And that seems to be breaking down in our society. Uh, the book Bowling Alone uh, pointed that out a rather long time ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's important to be supported in a community. That's where the, a religious community may be helpful mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a healthy religious community. Sure. Uh, because a supportive community can give your life purpose, meaning. Uh, and you can feel that camaraderie that's so important in, in a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add one more thing to that. The community is a very important factor in terms of what kind of community you need to be associated with. Because we always got to be associated, connected with some kind of a group that we can identify with the family and all that. But in, in a religious life, because that long for religious order, uh, in religious life, there's a lot of give and take where I have got to compromise my own will in order to accommodate my brother, you know, and, and everyone is in that kind of a dynamic to accommodate to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a little bit of selflessness mm -hmm. that so, and humility mm -hmm. that's absolutely an, an essential ingredient mm -hmm. for a successful community, right? Mm -hmm. A successful community. Mm -hmm. This community has a practice called clearness committees. Mm -hmm. If you have a major decision to make in your life, like whom to marry, or what's my next job? Or where shall I go to college? 
and you feel like you've made a really sound decision, but you're not quite sure and you want to check it out, you, you convene a clearness committee of generally three persons. You pick them out, but the meeting, uh, the, the whole religious body approves of these people you've picked out. And their duty is simply to listen to you and not to, not to advise you what to do, but simply to give you feedback of what they hear you saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that kind of guidance used to obtain in, in families, but you know, families are really suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the family structure is deteriorated in large part in many, in many societies. And uh, so wherever you find it, it may be in a religious community, it may, it may be in an association of people who uh, enjoy together an activity that helps them feel calm and, and happy together, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever. But uh, finding a supportive community is so important to mental health. It's such a wonderful feeling of feeling safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Safe, yeah. Being safe. Mm -hmm. but that reminds me, Tom, of some of the stories that I heard Father Van say when we were doing our meetings up till now about ways to connect with some of the people that have come to see you sometimes very reticently so at the hospital. And you told some pretty profound stories, I think, uh, talking about simply listening to them, simply letting them talk. I remember one time you said there was this one guy who really, he seemed almost angry when he walked in and mostly you just sat there and listened to him and when he was done, he thanked you. <laughs> yeah. I tell you that experience, in terms of active listening is so very important in the third period of care. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you can really tune into what that person is experiencing, you know, you control it in terms of, like you said before earlier, in terms of what's going on in my body, listen to that person mm -hmm. speak, you know, that. So it takes a lot of internal discipline on the part of, of the listener to be able to experience enough of what that person is saying and being connected. And I have found my time at times, uh, maybe almost cheering up, bodily, maybe what that person needs to experience mm. themselves. Mm. And I've had that experience, and, uh, and, and, and also the context. There's no judgment. There's no judgment. Uh, it's you are telling the truth, the story that needs to be told. And I need to hear it. And I need to understand it. There's no judgment. Mm -hmm. And there are wonderful things that can happen at that moment. Thank you so much for talking a bit more about community. And I think a lot of us, probably most of us, can resonate, especially with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, our communities were kind of either disrupted or, you know, maybe we were cut off from our communities, not by choice, but because of social distancing and because of just things that were going on. And so, I think more so than ever, you know, this is probably a time where we need to reintegrate with our communities, right, and rebuild those connections. Yes. And sometimes that can be daunting, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to experience anxiety with kind of forming relationships and building deep relationships. And I feel like after a time of social distancing to go back to re-engaging with people can be a bit daunting, but those social connections are really strong protective factors, just like we talked about. And so I think it really is important to find a community that you feel safe in, where you feel heard, where you feel validated. And so I, I just wanted to kind of echo what everyone said here and just kind of re-emphasize the, the, the emphasis on, you know, forming those relationships and having those connections, because I think that is really important. Um, I just want to ask, you know, because I feel like something that I've been thinking about is the term resilience. And so if someone could define what resilience is and why this term is often used in, you know, when we kind of reference moral injury or even when we talk about trauma-informed care, um, can we talk about resilience a bit? I can jump off just uh, start, start this a little bit. Um, when I talk to people who are struggling with issues and all that, I try to help them to remember what other similar kind of crisis have you had in your life before? Mm -hmm. And you have somehow resolved those crises, and you figured out what to do and all that. What were, what were the elements in that decision making to help you resolve it 
that you might be able to apply now. Uh, but the other thing too is a lot depends on, I think maybe formative development mm -hmm. and, and maturing and growing and all that. I think people who have grown up in hard times, difficult times, and have been able to, with their own resourcefulness, survive and be successful, mm -hmm. um, have a greater capacity later in life to deal with other future challenges that can give you the resilience to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so that's, that's um, I'd start that reflection yeah. with that. It's associated with grit that we back yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also I think it's, it's an admission of um, uh, humility amongst um, caregivers, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, etc., that um, they are not able to cure certain conditions. That is to say, well, to use a medical model, curing means that that you make a disease disappear mm -hmm. with medication or whatever, whatever that treatment it is. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas um, sometimes we in the religious community speak of healing, meaning that you're able to cope with perhaps a, a lingering chronic illness, but rather successfully, so that you demonstrate that resilient behavior. Yes. Yeah. So it's the it's the admission that you're not on the omnipotent cure uh, caregiver, uh, and that's important. Yeah. Although, although in my little universe, uh, in the particular style of Tai Chi that I really prefer more than any other, uh, does actually fall into the category of mindfulness and motion. And there's so much research on the neurological changes that occur when somebody practices mindfulness on a really regular basis. I think about Dr. Richard Davidson up at the University of Wisconsin and Madison, his whole team of uh, neuroscientists have decided that you can train your well being, like learning a new skill. Mm -hmm. And there are four constituents to it. And the first is a sense of resilience. Right. And the second is a sort of a positive mental outlook. I think the next one is the ability to pay attention. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the last thing, oh, an attitude of generosity. Mm -hmm. Apparently the more generous your manner, your, your, your spirit is, the healthier and the more well you will be. It's very, it's interesting. If you think about it. Well, I think that someone suffering from um, moral injury might have the hope that they could be like they were before, mm -hmm. before the incident. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the truth is that's not gonna happen yeah. uh, because what's done is done and cannot be undone. Mm -hmm. And so you, you bear scars, you bear uh, moral scars, mm -hmm. but you can be resilient in the way that you bear those scars. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned a lot sitting with the fellows coming back from prison they used to meet in this room adjoining, and they would say, "Oh, I, I felt I feel so sorry for what I did. I was stupid. Uh, I was young. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but I'm not going to dwell on that because if I dwell on that, I can't make progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a future, mm -hmm. and that future is what I'm focusing on. Period. Mm -hmm. And that was that was so instructive, uh, helpful. I think for for many people coming out of the military." Mm -hmm. trying to adapt to civilian life mm -hmm. and have done some things they're not they're not proud of uh, uh, and uh, but focusing on them is just going to keep you bogged down mm -hmm. and so like those fellows returning from prison they have to focus on the future mm -hmm. that brings up another point i may add to that <clears throat> and that is the capacity to forgive mm -hmm. yes and, and part of forgiving is to say yep i did something real stupid i was wrong i get it Give myself. I let it go. I let it go and move on. That's a process. That, that just doesn't happen. And it doesn't mean forgetting, right? It just means no. forgiving. Right, right. You'll never forget. But it's also a reminder of where you don't want to go again right. and, and make the same mistake again. That's you know. Um, you, you know, you know, there's ritual for that. And I experienced one time by an Elton Bosnia Hertz I went to one of these forward operating bases. And there was a soldier that was just not together. He was just isolated, alone. He knew I was a Catholic priest, Catholic, Catholic. 
And he says, I need to share something with you about something that bothered me. It was me to kind of trust there. I'm a sniper. Mm. I killed him. There, I'm more interested. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, other, other bad things in your life. Yes, that notice. He opened up a lot. Well, uh, he just made a confession. We don't know it. Uh, there's a sacrament we have called reconciliation. And so here's what I would like you to do in order to make a home. Mm -hmm. And it's really more symbolic than anything else. Mm -hmm. then, then the prayers of active contrition, prayers of absolution, mm -hmm. And, and, and there starts the healing process. Yeah. But the ritual makes him feel better. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and there's the healing process that takes place. Right. And I also then also say, as we you said now, and that is, this will always be part of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I use the example of Jesus. Do you remember forgive and forget? There's mm -hmm. no such thing as forgive and forget. Jesus, do you remember what happened to you? Oh, yeah, I do. But it's a reminder of my mercy, love. You know, so I oftentimes tell people that this will be a part of your life, but there'll come a point in time when you will make the transition of it being facilitating to now where it becomes empowering. Mm -hmm. Because you have wisdom and understanding about yourself and the vulnerability of human nature, that you are a better person today, not despite what happened, but because yeah. of what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's contributing, I think, to uh, resilience. Thank you so much for those powerful words. I think, you know, just looking at the past experiences as a way to grow and then looking to the future kind of as the hope, you know, I think that's really important. And I think what you mentioned, Father Van, of just the healing process, it's a process, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Right. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Usually there isn't a fix-all or a cure. And I think it's a process and we have to figure out what goes into that process of healing like you talked about and so thank you so much for that i think we have a little more than five minutes like a little less than 10 minutes but a little more than five minutes and so um before we say some um last thoughts i wanted to ask debbie if there's any questions in the in the um, zoom um and if not that's okay but are there any final thoughts that you want to share with um, our participants here today I know it's hard to sum it all up, right? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll share something um, that maybe as a final thought. If we are truly going to be helping other people who are going through struggle, we need to realize, and I think Carl Jung came up with this concept, you know, that we are the wounded healer. So we have to recognize our own woundedness as well, so that if we can identify with that brokenness in ourselves, mm -hmm. we have a better capacity to understand the brokenness of the other person. And we therefore become a person that knows how to contribute to the healing process. Mm -hmm. Well said, and I think that's really powerful because, you know, uh, right now the peer movement is really big and peer support is really big, especially in our state of Delaware. And peers are those who have lived experiences um, as it relates to behavioral health and now are in a position where they can help and be advocates and be role models for other individuals who are kind of in the same shoes or walking in the same path. And so I think what you said about kind of that shared experience is really powerful. And I think that is what creates empathy and that's kind of what creates the connection and that's what kind of starts the process of healing as well. And so thank you for mentioning that. When you fly, and get instruction from, uh, what do they call them? Um, flight attendant. Mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the, the mask. Oh, yeah. Put it on you first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. If you have a child, uh, they're going to be concerned about their welfare, but take care of your own mask first, because if yes. you don't have adequate oxygen, you can't help them. Yes. And that applies to the circumstances. Uh, if your own mental health is, is risky, um, you're not going to be able to find better health yourself by helping other people. You have to take care of yourself first. <laughs> so that's where that uh, the fifth point in the sixth. Mm -hmm. If you need mental health care, go to a professional and get it. Yeah, that's, that's
that's for sure. Yeah. Well said. Just like we do a physical every year, you know, we need to kind of take an inventory of our mental health. Are we are we okay? Are we doing well? And I think that's really important to do regular check-ins with our that's mental right. health. Yeah, mm -hmm. and make it normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think Debbie has a question. I was just going to say before you finish, can you provide some resources so people can get to you guys? Mm. Yeah. So I, I don't know if the panelists want to start with maybe their um, a way to contact you or sure sure um, go ahead you you, you first uh, I have a website it's pretty robust <laughs> um, the name of my company is Sculpt Your Life so if you just Google Jessica Lewis Sculpt Your Life I pop up but about 20 years ago when I went to get the domain, the one, the spelling I wanted was taken. So I had to manipulate the spelling of the website a little bit. If you look for that, if you're looking for the actual web address, it's www.sculpt, S-C-U-L-P-T. But then it's you are rather than why are you are, yourlife.com. <laughs> so, and if you go there, um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, no matter where you are, if you just click the contact button you'll automatically slide down to the bottom of any page and you can either shoot me an email hit the hit my cell join my mailing list or like me on all the social media or whatever um, so that's the best way to reach me uh ivw stands for interfaith veterans work group our website is IBW dot website. <laughs> uh, I don't maintain that as much as I do our Facebook page. Uh, so if you go to Facebook and search for IBW Interfaith Veterans Work Group, you'll find us. Uh, that site is kept up very, very current uh, with all kinds of resources for helping veterans. Yeah. Thank you. And I work for the VA, <laughs> so there are a lot of resources there. But if you want to get in contact with me directly at the VA, it would be Donald dot Van Alstein, which is V A N capital A L S T Y N E at VA dot gov. And I'll direct you to the right place to go, or we'll just have a conversation ourselves. So I just want to say one final thing. Uh, and, and I always feel like to get attention to uh, get attention of our soldiers um, when I was a chaplain. And that is that I say to them, I'm the only chaplain in the U.S. Army that doesn't do any counseling. However, I enjoy good conversation and I usually gain good insight and I might be able to share some insights with you. Because that word counseling sometimes is a lot. So let's yeah. just have a good conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you rephrase that, you know, it is a good conversation. And I think that's really important to highlight that counseling is a conversation. And so if counseling seems a little off putting kind of, you know, kind of twisting it a little bit and seeing it as a conversation, I think is really helpful too. So thank you so much for ending us on that note. We really appreciate everyone who was here today. I am from the Mental Health Association. So this recording will be on the Mental Health Association in Delaware website. I encourage you to visit our website. We have um, all of our recordings from the Head at Home series. Um, we have training information on there. So please visit our website again, the Mental Health Association in Delaware. And thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate you spending your evening with us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.